All right, welcome to the Ashbrook Center. Uh, most of us know our speaker this evening, or this afternoon, already quite well. Uh, John Moser is professor of history at Ashland University. He's also co-chair of our Master of Arts in American History government pro and government program. John did his undergraduate work at Ohio University. He has an MA and a PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's published numerous works on subjects ranging from comic books to Japanese foreign policy. He's the author of four books, the most recent of which is The Global Great Depression and the Coming of World War II, published by Paradigm in 2015. And most of you already know this, John, of course, pioneered game-based learning at Ashland University, which has really caught fire and has taken off. It's very interesting. His research interests include the World Wars, the Cold War, the 1920s, and of course, the Great Depression. Other research interests include advanced imperial probe droid technologies, enhanced interrogation techniques for rebel scum. <laughs> He's had mixed success as an imperial officer. He was chair of the Death Star Defensive Improvements Committee. <laughs> and he now spends most of his time avoiding eye contact with Darth Vader. <laughs> Today, John is speaking on a topic that's of particular importance in our galaxy, the Great Depression and World War II from economic crisis to international catastrophe. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Wilson. Thank you. All right. Is this working? No. I think I shut it off instead of unmuting it. There we go. How's that? No. Well, the green light's on, so it must be working. Don't tell me otherwise. Uh, I don't care if it works or not. I'm very loud. Um, how many of you ever heard of the Bretton Woods Conference, 1944? Not a whole lot, huh? Okay, a few of you there. Um, the Bretton Woods Conference was uh, it, it met in 19, July 1944, and the goal of that was to plan for the post-World War II economy. The reason why these various powers, especially the British and British and Americans, uh, called it, gathered there, but there were representatives from countries all over the world, was they were joined in the belief that one of the important causes of the Second World War had to do with the international economy. It's telling that so many of you have not heard of the Bretton Woods Conference. It was absolutely critical to, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was the, it set the rules for the post-war economy really until the early 1970s. Have you ever heard of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, that came out of there? the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, those things were, were, were created at, at Bretton Woods. Um, and they were born of a mutual agreement that the conditions that prevailed in the 1930s had played a major role in bringing on the war. And this is something that doesn't often get talked about today. If you look, and a lot of it is the historians who deal with the different subjects don't tend to talk to one another. Uh, the, the, the story of the Great Depression and the way that various countries responded to the Depression, that is something that has been traditionally the domain of economic historians and political historians, domestic political historians. Whereas the origins of World War II is a story told by diplomatic historians. And these are groups that don't talk to one another. Look at any American history textbook. You will see the chapter on the Great Depression and the New Deal probably written by a few historians, uh, political and economic historians, <coughs> followed by a chapter on the road to World War II, written by probably diplomatic historians. And even though those two things overlapped, I mean, they're going on at the same time, you get very little sense from reading these textbooks that the two, in fact, were totally intertwined. Now, that leads to the genesis of this book. It started out as, uh, as a, an essay I was asked to write for, um, uh, for the, 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 the Blackwell Companion to World War II. 
right? the reading that you got, and a few of you may have actually read, uh, was, uh, a, w I was I was commissioned to write this essay on the Great Depression, which is really a survey of the literature. What are the questions that have been asked? What are the questions that have, have, not, yet, have, have not yet been answered, etc.? And I came away from the whole thing thinking that there's a whole lot of great scattered information, plenty of books and articles that have been written about aspects of it, but there's nothing that really brings it all together. And at the end of the essay, I really call for the writing of this, this synthetic work. Well, some weeks after I submitted it, I got a call from the editor of uh, the, that, that, that companion saying, boy, I totally agree with you. Would you like to write it? And uh, they basically offered me a contract. It's a good thing. If you can get a contract before you write it, that's always great. Uh, much better than you know, writing it and then trying to shop it around, though that's probably the more common route. So anyway, that is how the book came into being, and the book has been out for about a year now. Uh, the paperback version, there were supposed to be copies here for you to purchase, but they did not arrive. All right. <laughs> My argument is that the, country, the way that various countries responded to the Great Depression laid the foundations for World War II. I am not an economist. I'm not an economic historian. I'm not interested, I mean, I'm interested, but my job is not to tell you why the Depression happened. I mean, his, economic, economists and economic historians still haven't come to a consensus on that. My job isn't to tell you what strategies were most successful in dealing with the economic crisis. There have been plenty of people that have written on that. I am interested specifically on how those strategies affected the international system. And my argument is that they, in fact, undermined them. This is a story with very few heroes. Uh, countries acted in a particular way, pursuing, their, the, the, pursuing domestic recovery, inevitably at the expense of, uh, of international relations. And the war was the final result of that. I want to I begin by talking about the efforts to try to revive the liberal international economic order these efforts that were made after World War I. Because if you look at much of the 19th century, right, goods and capital flowed pretty freely until you got till roughly the last quarter of the, 20, of the, sorry, of the 19th century when countries really started jacking up their tariffs, uh, really were, were, were making, uh, making strong efforts to protect domestic industry at the expense of, uh, of, of, of foreign competition. And you see this very strong in the years, especially before World War I. So if you've ever read Woodrow Wilson's 14 Points, one of the things that he thinks ought to be the basis of the post-war era is free trade. Free trade is important to peace, he said. So there were people who were talking that way even at the end of, uh, of World War I. And there was an effort to try to restore the liberal, when I say liberal, I mean the classical liberal economy uh, based on relatively, relatively free markets and, and, and limited government intrusion. But there were efforts to try to rebuild that liberal international economic order in the period after World War I. This was an effort that was led mainly by international bankers and businessmen who, had, uh, uh, who, who dealt in, uh, in, in, in things that traded across boundaries, right? International bankers, international businessmen. And they emphasized a few things. One, free trade. That is, tariffs kept to the lowest the lowest feasible point, so that goods could move freely from one place to another. Uh, something else they emphasized was the forgiveness of war debts and reparations. At the end of World War I, a lot of countries owed a great deal of money to the United States. And in the treaties that ended World War II, Germany was expected to pay, and its allies, were expected to pay significant reparations. So these liberal internationalists, you might say, these bankers and businessmen said, look, why don't we just forgive these things? Because they're going to end up being a drain on all these national economies. Finally, they called for the gold standard. Can anyone tell me why the gold standard is important to international trade, or at least a good thing for international trade? You know what the gold standard is, right? It's the idea that, that, that currency is based on gold. It has a fixed price in gold. Yeah, it's, um, the gold standard means that currencies, uh, their values relative to each other doesn't change that much. Yeah. So if I'm selling the same good to the same country, I can expect it 
to get a, a, a relatively stable price for it. And I can I, I know that I've been making to make yeah. to make money off. Yeah, great. Anybody who has traveled abroad has probably uh, experienced uh, going to the going to a website or whatever on a regular basis to see well what's the you know what, what's the exchange rate today? I need to get good deal a uh, good deal for my for my dollars. This is a relatively recent phenomenon. Back in the 19th century, most currencies were fixed on were, were fixed to gold at a certain rate. You knew what you were going to get for your dollar or your pound or your franc or your yen at any at, at any given time. Uh, this made for a very for for for, uh, for smooth international transactions. Right? No one felt like, well, okay, if I wait a few days, the terms are going to change so that I might get a better deal later. You knew what you were going to get for your price because all of the currencies were connected to one another through the stand through the gold standard. Right? Everybody, everybody get that? This is pretty important to my overall argument. These are the things that these. Uh, liberal internationalists were really pushing for. And they had mixed success at best. No, a lot of countries paid lip service to reestablishing the liberal international economic order, but very few followed through, at least to a complete extent. One of the reasons for this was that citizens during the First World War had been asked to make all sorts of sacrifices. They'd been called on to do all sorts of things that traditionally citizens had not been called on to do. Right? I mean, World War I was a huge war after all. People were being called on to fight and die. Those who remained at the home front had to sacrifice in all sorts of ways. Taxes went through the roof, etc. <coughs> there was a tacit, and in some places uh, outright, implication that out of this is going to come a better world where a more democratic world where the where the concerns of citizens are going to be taken more seriously than they had in the past after all if we're going to ask you to do all this stuff for the country it's only fair that we respond to your needs so governments in the post world war 1 era were extremely reluctant to do anything that risked serious economic distress at home uh, they very much wanted to uh, to uh, avoid unemployment, inflation, right? Things like that were were real no-nos. And if international trade or international capital capital flows were going to cause distress, then they are to be shunned. All countries kept their tariffs relatively high. A lot of lip service given to free trade, but not a lot of action. In this sense, the United States was the worst offender. The United States, after, uh, after Har the Harding administration came to power, actually jacked up its tariffs to unprecedented levels. And then, of course, would do so even higher, uh, to an even greater extent, 10 years later under the Smoot-Hawley Act. The United States refused to forgive war debts. The British and the French said, absolutely, we're not going to forgive German, we're not going to tell the Germans that they don't have to pay reparations. Why? These are important sources of revenue. If we don't get these revenues from abroad, we're going to have to jack up our taxes at home. So who wants to tell the taxpayers, we want you to pay more so that the Europeans can be given a break? Or what? who in England or France is going to say, we are going to jack up your taxes because we think the Germans have been treated badly and they shouldn't have to pay as much. Right? These were <coughs> political non-starters. <coughs> Nearly all countries did return to the gold standard in the 1920s, but you might say they had their fingers crossed behind their back. Gold especially tended to flow toward the United States in the 1920s because the United States was exporting tons of stuff, importing very little, and also collecting on war debts. Now, in a normally functioning gold standard, under a normally functioning gold standard, um, this would cause the currency to expand, right? Because if your gold reserves go up and your dollars are based on the number of dollars in circulation are based on the, on the, the size of the country's gold reserves, then the currency should expand, more of those dollars should find their way out of the country, and everything should regulate itself. But the Federal Reserve in the 1920s said this is dangerous. If we allow the money supply to expand along with the supply of gold, we run the risk of inflation. And inflation is bad, so we're not going to do it. So Federal Reserve policy in the 1920s was to sterilize gold. <laughs> 
which simply means we're going to put it in, the, in our uh, put it in our vaults and not let it affect the size of the money supply. So one of the big economic stories of the 1920s was this flow of gold from all over the world into the United States, and from there it wasn't really going anywhere, except in the form of loans to other countries. Now, when the Great Depression hit, it struck different parts of the world at different times. For example, the economic downturn in Germany started as early as 1928. Uh, in the United States, as well as Britain and Japan, it was around 1929, 1930 that you started to see real suffering. In Italy and France, it wasn't really until 1931 or 1932. In retrospect, it's easy for us to see this as an international phenomenon. And we, I mean, we, like in most periods of history, we know a whole lot more about what happened in the past than the people who lived through it. This was a deeply confusing time for the people who lived through it, especially, you know, the French were the worst about this. They saw all these ec this economic crisis taking place around the world, and it wasn't really affecting them yet. And the French convinced themselves that it's somehow the nature of our economy or of our, uh, our French esprit, right, our spirit, that, 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 that we don't get depressions. <laughs> Well, of course, that was, and then in Mussolini in Italy, right? he, Mussolini had been in charge in Italy since 1920. Mussolini said, see, this is the virtue of fascist economic, uh, fascist economic policies. Um, we don't get depressions. And it really affected the willingness of various countries to work together, because diff by the time the French economy was really starting to tank, the British economy was doing a lot better. And the you can imagine what the attitude of the British was. Yeah, you see? Um, so this was really an impediment to, uh, to, 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 to real collaboration among the, uh, among the various countries. The Depression had four major effects on international relations. First of all, it discredited liberal economic internationalism. In fact, it was blamed for the whole downturn. Uh, international bankers and businessmen had really been kind of regarded as heroes in the 1920s. Uh, not so much in the 1930s. J.P. Morgan's name was mud in the early 1930s in the, in, in the United States. And the sort of things that they championed, free trade, gold standard, etc., uh, those, those things were, were politically even less popular than they, than they had been in the 1920s. All countries, all the countries of the industrialized world, I should point out, responded to the crisis by pursuing domestic recovery at the expense of the international economy. Tariffs were increased to protect, uh, pr protect domestic industries from foreign competition. In the United States, this took the form of the Smoot-Hawley tariff passed under the Hoover administration, uh, taking the rates from that were passed in the early 1920s and pushing them up even farther. In Great Britain, the British version of this was called imperial preference. Uh, the idea was, let's have a big free trade zone consisting of all of our colonies, and the entire British, uh, the, the, all of our colonies and dominions. Right? Free trade between Canada and the, United, in, in the United Kingdom, free trade between uh, South Africa and Australia, but if anybody else wanted to sell stuff to any, any part of the British Empire, they had to overcome very high trade barriers. Right? That was imperial preference. Again, designed to strengthen the British Empire at the expense of the rest of the at the expense of the rest of the world. Currencies, one by one, were taken off the gold standard and devalued. Right? One of the biggest reasons to devalue the currency was to pump more money into the into, into the uh, into the national economy. Right? Everyone did this. We've got to spend money on public works. We've got we're going broke from unemployment payments. We've got to make more money available. We're limited in how much money is gonna, we can put into circulation as long as we're on the gold standard, but if we chuck the gold standard, we can just print as much money as we need. The goal, generally speaking, was for countries to rely on their own territories, as well as on colonies or satellite countries, as sources for raw materials and as markets for manufactured goods, and in the process to withdraw from the international economy. Okay. So the United States is not going to worry about trade with Europe and Asia. It's going to rely on its own very large geographic area, uh, plus uh, Latin America, which was kind of a, 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 which was almost an extension of the United States economically. 
So most, uh, most of the trade of those countries was with the United States. Uh, Britain had, had their empire, the French had their empire, etc. However, some countries could better approach self-sufficiency <coughs> than others. That is, some countries were better equipped to move towards self-sufficiency than others. Right? If, you're the, if you're, you're the United States, and you have the whole continental United States, plus some colonies in the Caribbean, and Alaska, maybe you get something out of that, and Hawaii, and you've got Latin America kind of at your beck and call, yeah, it's not tough, not tough to come close to self-sufficiency. Right? Just about everything that Americans needed, uh, maybe with the exception of rubber, could be produced within the Western Hemisphere. Same thing with Great Britain. The British Empire was huge. Just about anything that any, but any, any subject of, uh, of, uh, of His Majesty the King could need could be produced somewhere within the British Empire. The Soviet Union, same deal, absolutely massive. Lots of raw materials, and these, and these places also become markets for, uh, markets for manufactured goods. But what about smaller countries? What about Germany? What about Italy? What about Japan? This brings me to the second major effect of the Great Depression on international relations. It encouraged the spread of militarism in all three of the countries I just mentioned. All of these countries were heavily dependent on imports to fuel their industrial economy, even to feed their populations. Germany did not have enough land area to feed the German people, to, to grow food to feed the German people. So, they're, so they need to import stuff. Self-sufficiency, given the territory that is under their control, is not an option. But that doesn't mean that they don't want self-sufficiency. It's just if they're going to become self-sufficient, they've got to build empires. And that's the story of, Ger of, 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 of German and Italian and Japanese foreign policy. I'm not going to say too much about Italy, just because it's abilities to act on its ambitions were, shall we say, limited. Uh, but certainly, with the, certainly the case with Germany and, and, and Japan. The National Socialist regime in Germany, the ultranationalists who dominated the government in Japan, and by the way, who came to power as a direct result of the Depression, they all, they all predicted that there's going to be some great climactic war in the future. For Germans, this was going to be an anticipated war against the Soviet Union. The goal was Lebensraum, right? We're going to conquer this space, living space. It doesn't mean living room. <laughs> don't, don't visit a German and, <laughs> and say, can you show me your Lebensraum? <laughs> it's, it's living space, it's not living room. Wohnzimmer is what they just call it, living room. There you go, you learn a little something. <laughs> For the Japanese, the intended enemies were the European colonial powers, the British, the French, and the Dutch. Why? Because they all had colonies in East Asia that produced a lot of raw materials. So the Japanese said, we have to bring all these under our, under our control. But if you're going to plan for a big climactic war to get what you want that will make your country self-sufficient, if that's a long-term goal, then your short-term goal has to be rapid rearmament. You've got to build up your, your, your armed forces to peak efficiency if you're going to be able to take on powerful, uh, other powerful countries as enemies. So that meant, in the short term, ironically, becoming more dependent on imports. You need lots of stuff if you're going to build up. Like the Germans had to import all sorts of iron ore and oil. They didn't produce anything. There was no oil produced in Germany. Uh, the Japanese had to import practically everything. I mean, what's Japan? It's a, it's a bunch of volcanic rocks with a little bit of uh, arable land where you can grow rice. Anything that the, the, any, anything that's needed to, 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 uh, for, the, for the purpose of, develop, of building up the armed forces had to be brought in from the outside. It also meant producing less for export. If you were going to commit your economy to producing tanks and aircraft and artillery and rifles, et cetera, and ammunition, then you're not producing you know, crap that you can sell to other countries. This means that all imports go up to those countries and their exports go down. Germany and Japan kept running out of they're running running out of gold and running out of foreign <coughs> currency, or at least coming close. So what do they do? Well, they engage in acts of aggression, aimed at taking stuff, right? That will that will that will help them to continue rearmament. Uh, Germany seizes Aust Austria in 1938. Czechoslovakia in 1939, they seize all kinds of gold and foreign currency in addition to raw materials like iron ore 
Th these are frankly wars of plunder meant to keep the economy going so we can continue building up the military in order to fight that climactic battle which is a few years down the road. Japan, meanwhile, kept encroaching on China, doing the same thing. Why didn't countries like the United States and Great Britain and France and, and the Soviet Union work together? In, a, in an ordinarily functioning international system, the so-called status quo powers can usually be counted on to work together to try to, to, to prevent acts of aggression or black acts of aggression by, uh, uh, by let's say, uh, revisionist powers that want to overthrow the order. Well, the reason for this is the Depression's third major effect on international relations. Those countries were all squabbling with one another as a result of the Depression and the ways that these countries responded to the Depression. <coughs> the fact is, if you look at the United States, France, and Great Britain in the 1930s, each of them blamed the others for their economic distress. The United States had the audacity <laughs> to criticize the British for establishing imperial preference when, they, when the Americans had the highest tariffs in the world, but okay. Uh, and also for pulling off the gold standard. The British pulled off the gold standard before the United States did. The British and the French each accused the other of discriminating against them in international trade. Right? The British said the French are, are, are putting up barriers specifically to go against uh, British goods. The French claimed the same thing. By the way, the two countries were like, they despised one another by the middle of the 1930s. They were practically in a trade war with one another. One thing that the British and the French did agree on, however, was that the United States was making things worse by keeping their tariffs high and still demanding the payment of war debts, even when it was obvious that, oh, that, that, that there was serious economic crisis in, uh, throughout Europe. The great powers met in London in 1933. This is a, one of the great what-ifs of international economic history. There was a conference aimed at developing a joint strategy to revitalize world trade and promote international recovery. In fact, no country sent delegates that was pre no country that sent delegates delegates was prepared to do anything significant that might jeopardize domestic recovery. The whole thing that got shut down after FDR sent a terse telegram, uh, blaming the whole thing on international bankers and saying we're not interested in monetary stability because it suits our purposes now to let the value of the dollar simply float. So all these countries were at each other's throats. Every country blaming it, blaming the others for, uh, for what was going on. And in a sense, they were all right. This in turn produced the fourth and final effect of the Great Depression on international relations. These countries were unwilling to work together to try to, to stop aggression from, Britain, from uh, Germany or, or Japan. So what they did was individually try to make the best deal they could with the aggressors. Now, you know, Germany and Japan might have had, they certainly had unlovely regimes. But there's one thing, they might, they might be a menace to their neighbors, indeed they were, but there was one thing you could say for them. They were good customers. Continuing to sell to them made a certain amount of, of, of sense at a time when export business was slow. They were willing to buy huge, per, huge amounts of strategic, of, of strategic resources, and they were willing to pay. Great Britain in the 1930s basically signaled that it no longer had any interest in upholding the Treaty of Versailles, which limited German power after World War I. Uh, France was more interested in forcing Versailles, but it really didn't have any friends willing to help it to do so. So France just shifted its whole strategy. The original French strategy for dealing with a potentially aggressive Germany was to send the French army rampaging into Western Germany. They wanted to make damn sure that the next war, if there was going to be one, was not going to be fought on French territory the way that World War I was. So the French army was going to go in to a certain, you know, to the Rhineland, which under the Treaty of Versailles was supposed to be demilitarized. The French army was just supposed to go in there and occupy that territory and then wait for the Germans to back down. And in fact, they did something very much like that in 1924, when the Germans were cheating on, uh, on, on reparations payments. By the way, this is something worth mentioning. It's a myth that uh, 
Uh, it was only under Hitler that Germany started treating, started violating the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans started violating the Treaty of Versailles uh, while the, the ink was still wet. Uh, every opportunity they had to get around its provisions. But Hitler was just a lot more blatant about it. So France changed its policy. Seeing that it wasn't going to get help from abroad, said, well, we're going to switch to a defensive policy, and we're going to build a big wall. Uh, let's call it the Maginot Line, after a particular French foreign minister. By the way, the Maginot Line actually, uh, it could actually be justified as a, a, a means of alleviating the Depression. Because in addition to being a very formidable line of defense <laughs> all along the, the France's border with Germany, it was also a massive public works project. It put thousands of Frenchmen to work pouring concrete, putting in gun emplacements, doing all that, that doing all of that stuff. Uh, and it was a particular this was particularly good because <laughs> eastern and northeastern France was particularly hard hit by the uh, by the depression. So the Maginot the construction of the Maginot line was a wildly popular strategy in France. Not only because it, it employed people, but because it was a signal to the world that France isn't going to mess with anybody else. Don't mess with us, and we won't mess with you. The United States. The Roosevelt administration, to its credit, allowed its trade with Germany to dwindle to just about nothing, rather than play the, the game of trade by Germany's rules, which is another story. However, the United States continued to sell all kinds of strategic resources to Japan. The Japanese war effort could not, in, in, in the Japanese outright invaded China, and there was warfare between Japanese and Chinese forces consistently from 1937 until 1945. Right? So you know, ask somebody in China when World War II started. They won't say 1939. They'll say 1937. Uh, and uh, that war effort was made possible in part by regular deliveries of supplies from the United States. Only in 1939-1940 would this change. Great Britain and France, as you probably know, declared war on Germany after Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939. Uh, and in 1940, the Roosevelt administration started placing economic sanctions on Japan, uh, finally ceasing all trade with Japan in mid-1941. As you may know, this ultimately is what provoked Japan into attacking Pearl Harbor on December 7th. But by this time, the <laughs> Axis powers had become so strong that it would take the largest and most destructive war in history to bring them down. A few lessons from this for today. The big one. I, I think this entire story adds powerful evidence for the argument that Trade and finance are the most powerful forces making for peace in the modern world. Right? International trade, international finance has probably done more for world peace, certainly than the United Nations and the League of Nations and all the peace societies and all the peace marches you can imagine put together. Not that any of those I mentioned are bad things, it's just that, international, that the, flow of, the, the flow of goods and the flow of capital has done more to, uh, to uh, uphold peace. It stands to reason from there that political measures that impede the flow of goods and capital, for whatever good effects might come from them, are going to tend to have a damaging, uh, a, a damaging effect on international affairs and are going to tend to make war more likely. The international order simply is not something that can be ignored when it becomes inconvenient. Unfortunately, when there is economic distress, that's, that's what people's tendencies are. They tend to forget about foreign affairs. Elections, uh, for example, tend to focus entirely on how do we get out of this mess we're in, and politicians even stop talking about international affairs. That's not really the case with this one. There's been quite, quite a lot of talk about, about international relations. But in recent memory, some have ignored international relations altogether. In a global economy, it's important to remember that even measures that appear to be strictly domestic are, can often have important implications for the rest of the world. Even things that look like they make sense here could inflict damage on other countries. And that ought to be taken into consideration. We also have to, do, to recognize that economic distress often produces violence, 
and aggressive actions. For example, look at what Vladimir Putin has been doing uh, in, in Ukraine and, uh, and before that in South Ossetia. Putin's actions, I mean, look, I'm not a reductionist here. I don't claim that economic factors explain everything. But I do think that what was going on, economic policies and the, and the depression itself were the necessary yet insufficient condition of World War II. Um, it's not enough, you know, on its own, what happened in the economy in the 1930s would not have brought on war. But I am all, I can, I can almost guarantee that war would not have happened without the Great Depression and the way the countries responded. Economic crises are bad. Anyone who's lived through them, especially anyone who's had it affect them personally through a loss of jobs, uh, they're, they're, they're nasty things to live through. But they're better than fighting world wars. And that ought to be kept in mind as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is obviously a huge subject. The book spans you know, 30 years of, uh, of, of history, uh, of global history. So there's a, lot more, there's a lot more in the book, obviously, than I can touch on here. I'm just giving you a, 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 an outline. Uh, I'm happy to go into more detail on anything or clear up any misconceptions you might have. So please. I need my cricket sound effect. <laughs> I'm, um, so well, first of all, uh, I think we're speaking on this today. So <laughs> what um, I'm wondering about what you're saying about this being a great force of, uh, for peace, looking at uh, tensions today between America and <coughs> China, uh, if, um, with America expanding its um, free, free trade agreements in that region um, <coughs> without including China, do you think that, uh, that that's a, a mistake? Does China have to be a part of that, or do we simply have to maintain the trade that we already have? I think we, we, oh, we already have an awful lot of, uh, of trade with China, obviously. I would oppose efforts to try and, and cut back on that, to impose sanctions on, uh, on, on China. Um, but I don't know that we necessarily have to expand it even farther either. Um, it could make for better, for better relations, but I don't see things as, I don't see the status quo as necessarily leading, as leading to any sort of, of, of conflict either. The, Trade is so important to both sides as it is that, uh, that I think that would, in the long term, work to moderate Chinese foreign policy and American foreign policy. Yeah, David. Um, so with looking on the past of this, would you say that war reparations should not be installed on other countries? I don't know that I would make an absolute, uh, if, I would, if I would state that unequivocally, um, I think there was good reason for, um, for considering other factors when it came, uh, when it came to Germany. And, you know, a lot, I, I actually think that the harshness of the Versailles Treaty has been overstated in many ways. Uh, it was humiliating without, in the long term, I mean, look, if the Versailles Treaty was really so crippling, why is it that Germany so quickly bounced back to be a major, a major economic, economic power? But so much of, uh, so in and of itself, the reparations may not have been such a, such a big deal. The problem is the reparations in conjunction with the, with the war debts, in conjunction with, uh, with protectionist trade policies, I think combined to really, uh, to really create a deadly brew in the 1920s. I mean, there've been. There's nothing new about reparations. Uh, in the Franco-Prussian War, the, uh, the the Germans forced the French to pay reparations, and the French paid them off pretty darn quickly, faster than they were required to. It was a mo it was a point of pride for the French that they were going to get out from under this 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 humiliation as quickly as possible. So they don't. They're not necessarily. They don't necessarily wreck economies, but they can. Yeah. 
What are the major part of the rise of militarism and desire for conquest in the Axis countries? Uh, being the desire for uh, raw materials and wealth, what prompted the Italian invasion of uh, Ethiopia, a country yeah. which really had neither? Yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's a joke that said that um, if there was any wealth in Ethiopia, the British would have stolen it years ago. Uh, but the fact was it remained an, an independent country, one of only two independent, independent that is, African-ruled countries in, uh, uh, in Africa. Um, in fact, there were lots of very hopeful predictions about, uh, about resources that, w that could be found there. And you know, we know in Ethiopia today there's, there's oil resources. The question was getting to them, and the technology at the time wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. There were all sorts of, uh, the Italian government launched all sorts of initiatives in Ethiopia in the late 1930s to try to develop it as, a, as an important colony. So I think the Italians thought that they would get something out of it. Um, also, and this is this is where I would this is a classic case of, of where I would argue that that um, <coughs> economics don't explain everything. Part of it was just the need for the regime to win military glory at a time when the economy was uh, when the economy was suffering. Um, it is an interesting thing about Mussolini. Right? Unlike the case with uh, Germany, where an entire government fell during the depression and, and Hitler came to power. Or Japan, where yeah, the emperor was still in power, but there was a, there was a definite shift from civilian government to military government. In in, in Italy, it was the same people running the country. Right? Um, uh, Mussolini was uh, Mussolini was the Il Duce in the 20s as well as in the 1930s, but he showed no inclination to engage in foreign conquest in the 1920s. Why? He was getting big loans from J.P. Morgan. Now I said, ooh, J.P. Morgan was bankrolling the fascist regime. Well, yeah. But in the process, Mussolini understood that if, if he engaged in, in international aggression, he would jeopardize this, this, this very lucrative source of, source of capital. What happens? The depression comes, the source of capital gets cut off, and suddenly Mussolini's off the leash. So, thank you for asking about that. The, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> uh, you, were, you were making the distinction in your, your talk about the, uh, the status quo countries and then these aggressors like Germany, Japan, and Italy. Um, today, is this a similar situation that we're in? And are there these great distinctions between status quo countries and aggressive countries that are trying to come onto the world stage? I think uh, Russia is a, is a revisionist country. It sees itself as being uh, as being unfairly treated by the current order. Uh, it's certainly, in some ways, I think it's justified. I mean, it doesn't like the the expansion of NATO to include uh, areas that were you know, that were formerly part of the uh, part of the Soviet Union. I, I think that's an unnecessary uh, waving the red cape in front of the bull. Um, and 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 Putin's uh, the the economic situation in Russia. Uh, especially given the price of oil, is very, very bad. So that's a, that's a toxic combination, uh, a worsening economic situation, a, a worse, worsening economy combined with a belief that the current international system is unjust. Uh, that, that brings on acts of aggression. You know, will hit, will, will hit, uh, sorry, I didn't even say it. Will Putin uh, attempt to go farther? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, and, and, and as a historian, I really don't like making predictions. But, but uh, it, it's it, it bears watching. Let's say, let's put it that way. Uh, North Korea might be another example. Completely, a complete economic basket case, um, but believes that it's uh, that, that it's it's cornered. Um, I don't know if I'd say that say it about Iran, maybe. Um, so there have been depressions or large economic uh, downturns, not as large as the Great Depression, yep. before, uh, before the war, well, long before World War One. So I'm wondering, um, what, was this um, protectionism a common reaction to it, or was it the severity of the Great Depression that led to that? Yeah, it was the severity, and and and, and you remember that this 
I, I don't want this to be all about tariffs, although that's, a, that's an important part. Um, World War I is a big turning point because economists, certain liberal economists before the war, said if there is another war, and it seems unlikely, it can't last long because the, the demands that modern warfare will place upon economies would be so crippling, it's, they're going to be over, I mean, within months, uh, the economies are going to be, are going to be melting down and, and, and uh, uh, the war, war will have to end. That obviously didn't prove to be the case, right? Modern industrial economies were able to, to fight wars for, uh, for over four years. And the credit for that was given to the fact that governments took over more of the economy than ever before. Um, they really became, I mean, it, the, the term that was used in Germany was war socialism. Uh, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't socialism in the, in, the, in the Marxian sense, but it was government control of the, uh, of the economy. And, and, and it seemed to work. I mean, look, living conditions were, were, were not great, but the war was able to be sustained. Um, and it wasn't the economy unless you count the British blockade and starvation, that, 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 that really brought down the central powers. It, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was military, it, it was it was military defeat that brought down those powers. So this was an object lesson for what to do in future crises. And it's very interesting. If you look at the, if you look at the New Dealers, um, while Hoover was in office, the, 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 the experts who gravitated toward, toward uh, Franklin Roosevelt and looked to him as to be the guy who would, who would take over in 1933, said that, that, that we really need to bring back the agencies that we had in World War I. That World War I shows you what you can do if you bring the economy under government, under government control. And it's a different kind of crisis to be sure, but we can work. Get smart people together to run things and take it out, take it away from the uncertainties and the vicissitudes of the market and things will, things will work themselves out. You spoke a lot on the economic and the militaristic tendencies and the ducks position there before World War II. Uh, as you know, before the U.S. entered uh, conflict formally, we established Lend-Lease with Great mm -hmm. Britain. What do you think the military and economic implications were of that? Well, uh, it, it <coughs> saved Great Britain. Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it really is worth paying attention to. There, there's this great letter that, that Churchill sent to FDR uh, in, in December of 1940, where he laid out the country's situation uh, and said, "Here, you know, we, we've avoided defeat. The Battle of Britain is over. Uh, the, 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 we no longer are contending with bombers flying over, German bombers flying over. The immediate threat is, 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 is past. But there are bigger things on the horizon. There are German submarines really messing with our shipping. We're still, so we need stuff, but we're broke. Our, our, our gold reserves and our dollar reserves are, are at zero practically. So we can't pay for this stuff. Um, I, I, so I really do think without Lend-Lease, Great, uh, Great Britain would have lost the war. Um, there are some who have claimed that Lend-Lease was really cynical on the part of the United States, because the United States did get some good stuff out of it. Specifically, they got promises that Britain would dismantle imperial preference. It didn't happen until after the war, but it was a promise that was uh, that was that was built into the uh, that was built into the lend lease agreement. I don't think it was cynical. Um, there's an author called Warren Kimball who wrote a book on, on lend lease called "The Most Unsorted Act," which is a quote by Churchill. Churchill called lend lease the most unsorted act that had ever happened. It, it, it really was a uh, it really did reflect the administration's concern and most Americans' concern that if Great Britain fell, that the results would be catastrophic for the United States. Okay, one more question. <coughs> I was getting warmed up. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, Tucker. How can we uh, expect to contain uh, aggressive countries like Russia? with uh, their militaristic tendencies on encroaching in the <coughs> Soviet Union without yeah. economic sanctions. Yeah, yeah well, I, I'm not arguing that sanctions are necessarily a bad thing, though that seems like it's in conflict with, with the point I was making. Uh, it's because, in fact, there was, there was more trade, arguably, going on between Germany and, uh, 
uh, and, and Britain in the late 1930s, and more trade going on between the United States and Japan in the late 1930s than had, there had been in the Depression. So if all you do is look at that and say, well, then things are obviously getting better. The question is, where is that, where is that trade going? Um, in fact, very, very little of it was finding its way into the civilian economy. So if, if trade only involves uh, uh, stuff that's allowing a country to, mil to militarize, then uh, trade sanctions are actually better than allowing that to continue, I would argue. Um, it's, 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 it's civilian, it's, it's, it's trade and, trade and uh, finance of the civilian economy that is really the hallmark of a healthy international order, not helping, uh, not helping a country to rearm. That's not to say I'm 100% opposed to, to, you know, to military trade either, but if you've got a, if you've got a nasty revisionist country, um, yeah, and, and, and by not selling strategic resources to it, you, can, you might be able to, to moderate its stance, then do it. I, I would also say that, that, that um, Think that I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a big fan of multilateral approaches, and this is one of the things that the depression really did. It made multilateral action impossible because the various countries that could be expected to uphold the international order were barely on speaking terms with one another. Okay. Oh. Let's thank Professor. Mitchell. It's pretty self-evident why we're so fortunate to have him here. Not only a, don't listen to this. He's not only a first-rate historian. He's a lively, interesting, great teacher. Did, did so. my wife hear that? <laughs> you want me to write that down? Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks for coming. Just uh, one quick announcement for me. The next colloquium is Friday, February 26th. And that's Michael Felper, and he'll be coming to speak on religious liberty and Jews in America. And I think he'll be talking a little bit about, uh, especially about uh, President Washington's famous letter to the Hebrew congregation at Newport, Rhode Island. So, so that should be very, very interesting. He's a very thoughtful fellow. Uh, Roger has an Yeah, before you guys go, and forgive me, the folks from the public here, but since most of you are assembled a little bit uh, uh, for, the, for all the Ashbrooks are here, let me say something uh, about the memorial dinner this year. Uh, you probably saw the postcard or, you, or heard that we said, save the date, Thursday, March 3rd, and you're probably wondering who the speaker is, and, uh, and I am too. Uh, <laughs> what I have done is sent a letter to all 12 of the Republican candidates running for office and invited them to an Ashbrook presidential forum that night. Now, you saw last night that even, you know, not all of them will even show up at a Republican <laughs> debate. So, I have no idea if this is going to work. We've never tried something like this before. We've never had a field this big where an event like this um, could possibly be done. We're reaching out to all of our friends who play in politics around the country, trying to get them to encourage the campaigns to accept the invitation. I'm hoping that we'll get two or three of the candidates who might come. If, if it really takes off, it's probably going to be an afternoon and evening event. We're not going to put them on stage together. If we do the, uh, uh, well, if we do the party takes over the event, it becomes more like a debate. And if they have a conversation, it can't be our event. So what I've said in the invitation to them is come give a 20 minute talk. We'll have 15 minutes of Q&A and it'll be the same questions asked of all the candidates. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see if it works. Um, don't spread the word about it yet. Uh, I don't want to read about it on Facebook and Twitter and such. If, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how this goes. My guess is that if this materializes, it's going to happen within the week before the event. So that's why we're telling everyone just hold that date. The, the, it's, it's after Super Tuesday on March 1st. And on March 15th, there are the Ohio and Florida primaries. So they're going to be in Ohio a lot, so we intentionally picked that date, uh, hoping that they, they, uh, they might take the invitation. But um, uh, just wanted to put your minds at rest as to you know, who the speaker might be. I'm very curious to find out myself. We'll see, we'll see if this works. Make sense? Yeah. That's cool. Thanks. Thank you. Roger.